Uh, thank you for, for coming tonight. Uh, it's been 35 years that we've uh, been doing what we've been doing on the oceans of the world. Um, uh, it's only been actually about five years that we've been on uh, Animal Planet, and I've always said pretty much for four decades that the most powerful weapon on the planet is the camera. And if it isn't on television, it isn't happening. So it was very important that we got it onto, onto television and Animal Planet. You know, actually, we tried to... Uh, uh, get this program on to all, all, we approached all the different networks and of course they all turned it down and uh, Animal Planet turned it down uh, and then they came back to us and said well okay let's try it. They're always, they were worried about the controversy, they were worried about, they thought it was too dangerous but you know I had gone to them on all, I said look the, you know the, the most uh, successful TV show on Discovery right now is a bunch of guys going into some very rough remote waters to catch crabs. Uh, we can send people into, we can send people into far more remote waters, colder waters, uh, much uh, worse conditions and we'll send men and women from all over the world to save whales and we'll throw in penguins and icebergs. It's got to be more compelling than catching crabs every week. <clears throat> Thanks. So it, it, it has reached millions of people all over the, all, all over the world and uh, it's amazing where you know we get recognized in Namibia or Greece or you know all over the world really. It's amazing how many people actually watch that show. And uh, so that's helped uh, considerably, and our organization has gotten stronger, and the stronger we get, the more effective we can become. And uh, over the last two years, we've been very effective in going after the Japanese whaling fleet. Our objective right from the beginning when we started the campaigns in the Southern Ocean in 2002 was to sink the Japanese whaling fleet economically, that is, to bankrupt them. We have achieved that. They... They are $200 million in debt. They're not going to recover. And uh, the only reason they're continuing to go down there is because of massive government subsidies. And in this last year, they took $30 million from the Earthquake Tsunami Relief Fund uh, to fund their operations down there. I don't think that's what people had in mind when they donated to that fund. And so that's actually caused quite a bit of a scandal uh, in Japan itself. And, uh, but the most important thing is five years ago, nobody in Japan even know they were, knew they were down there. Now they know they're there. There's a controversy, there's a discussion, and people in Japan are, are speaking out against it. And I think that's probably the best uh, progress that we could have made. <laughs> the season before last, uh, they only got 17% of their quota. This last season they got 26% and the reason why they did better is because unfortunately our vessel, our scout vessel, the Bridge of Bardot, was uh, hit by a rogue wave and uh, was damaged and couldn't proceed. And without a scout vessel it's very difficult to close in on the factory ship because the Japanese whaling fleet sacrifices their harpoon vessels to chase us, which is good because they're not killing whales, but as long as they're on our tail we can't close in on the factory ship, they just constantly relay our position. So we need those scout ships. And to rectify that, uh, we're, we intend to return at the end of this year with a campaign I'm calling uh, Operation Zero Tolerance. And that means our objective, our objective is zero whales killed. And it's also sort of a play on the Japanese World War II playing the zero. So we're going to incorporate that in there. But uh, to do that, we need to get a fourth vessel. And that's what we're working for. Two scout vessels, two ships, two helicopters, and two drones, and 120 volunteers from around the world. That, and I think, I think with that, we will be able to head them off before they kill whales and stop them. Now, as important as the ships and the helicopters are, the most important element in this whole equation for Sea Shepherd is the passion and the courage of the volunteer crew members from around the world who make it possible for us to do what we do. You know, we get criticized from people like, oh, my, you know, your crew aren't professional, they're amateurs, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Well, you know what? I couldn't pay people to do what these people do for nothing. <laughs> and in 35 years, our unprofessional crew of amateurs and uh, inexperienced crew have not had a single injury. We have not caused a single injury. We've not had an oil spill. We've not gone aground. Uh, meanwhile, the Japanese whaling fleet, which is crewed by professionals, has had three fatalities, numerous injuries, oil spills, and a catastrophic fire. So it's not, you know, I think one of the reasons for that is the one advantage of inexperienced crew is they're very, very careful, and they take the cautions <laughs> because they know that they, they don't know 
everything. And sometimes knowing, thinking you know too much can get you into trouble. Um, we're now taking on campaigns around the world. We have uh, Sea Shepherd chapters that are spreading up around the world, which we actually are spreading up faster than we can keep track of them. Uh, last year I attended the, um, in July, it was the International Whaling Commission meeting in the Isle of Jersey in the Channel Islands, and we brought the Bridge of Bardo there. And uh, NGOs come from around the world. And I noticed that there were twice as many Sea Shepherd representatives there than all of the other NGOs put together. And some of the big groups came over and said, how could you afford to bring 65 people to, to, the, to Jersey for this? I said, we didn't. Uh, I didn't even know they were going to be here. They all came on their, own, on their own expense. And as they were going through and people saying, well, you know, they were going to IFAW and everything, everybody identifying who they were. And, and uh, then they started with the Sea Shepherd thing, Sea Shepherd Switzerland, Sea Shepherd France. And somebody said, Sea Shepherd Jersey. I said, we have a Sea Shepherd Jersey? <laughs> and that, so what that means is that we're an organization of volunteers and we encourage people to get involved uh, because this is the only thing that's really going to make a difference in the world is uh, the involvement of people all over the world who, whose imagination and courage and, uh, and passion, more important than anything else, really can change things in the world. And that's what we try to um, empower our crew members with this understanding that, you know, you can make a difference. Even though the odds might seem overwhelming, one person can make a difference. Small groups of people can make a difference. Far more than governments or big organizations. And when you look, and when you look at, and when you look at every single social revolution in history, it's always been carried out by the passion of individuals or small groups of individuals. It wasn't Abraham Lincoln who ended slavery in America. It was the passion of Wilberforce and Douglas. And Woodrow Wilson, although he signed the bill to give women the right to vote, opposed them every step of the way. It was all of those unsung women who you know, were arrested and, and uh, were beaten to get that right. Things don't come easy, but it comes through that kind of passion. And sometimes, and sometimes when people say, oh, it's just so overwhelming, I mean, it's just the odds are so impossible, how can we even ever hope to get anything? I always uh, am inspired by the fact that in 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was unthinkable, uh, unimaginable, and impossible. And yet, it happened. And therefore, I think that we can come up with solutions to these problems. We just have to apply our imagination and uh, our passion and apply that with courage. And I think that that can bring about great changes. What we do also is called aggressive nonviolence. We're proud of our record of having never injured anybody. It's a record we intend to keep. But there is this perception that we're violent because we destroy long lines and sink a few whaling ships here and there. And, but I adhere to Martin Luther King's uh, definition of nonviolence when he said you cannot commit an act of violence against a non-sentient object. Violence can only be committed against a living thing. And when you destroy a non-sentient object that is being used to kill or cause pain to a living thing, that in effect is a nonviolent act. And although we get condemned by many people for being violent, the one thing that has given me an affirmation we were on the right path was in 1985 when I had a Tibetan Buddhist monk come to the ship in Seattle and give me this little statue of a, some horse-headed dragon demon sort of looking thing. It was very colorful, but I didn't know what it was, but he asked us to put it on the mast, and we did, and it was there for a few years. But in 1989, a few years later, I had the opportunity to meet with and speak with uh, the Dalai Lama, and I brought a photograph of it to show it to him, and figuring, well, he would know what it is. And uh, he said, oh, yes, that's called uh, Hayagriva. I sent it to you. So I said, well, what does it mean? He says, well, it's the symbol for the compassionate aspect of Buddha's wrath. <laughs> and so I said, um, so I said, well, what, what does that mean? And he looked at me and says, oh, you never want to hurt anybody. But sometimes when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> and thus, thus that's why we have the black ships and the Jolly Roger and 
we tend to be scary. And it works because the propaganda that goes out there scares our enemy. Two years ago, the Japanese couldn't get a supply ship because every time they tried to charter a vessel, the owners would say, well, those people are eco-terrorists. You know, they kill people. We're not going to go out there. <laughs> so, you know, so we've actually been able to win a lot of our campaigns by just showing up. And uh, it's amazing how when we pull up long lines, the fishing boats that deploy those long lines, instead of fighting for them, actually run away from us. And again, that's based on building up a reputation. And of course, our Jolly Roger flag helps with that. But one of the reasons that we have, there's two reasons we have the Jolly Roger flag. Uh, one, because uh, people like the logo, especially kids. You know, pirates are fa fascinating. And um, also because back in the 17th century, when piracy was out of control in the Caribbean, it wasn't the British or the Spanish navies that shut down the pirates. And the reason for that was that a lot of politicians and uh, merchants were making a lot of money out of piracy. And uh, a lot of bribery was going along. So piracy flourished, despite the fact that the Royal Navy was in the area. Piracy was shut down by Henry Morgan, a pirate. If you want to get, pirate, get rid of pirates, you get a pirate to do it, not the government, because those politicians are the biggest pirates of all. And um, so that was accomplished. And when you look throughout history at the accomplishments of pirates, set aside in the propaganda, the United States Navy was founded by John Paul Jones, a pirate. And not many people realize that he also founded the Russian Navy. Because being a pirate, he wasn't going to sit around and be some admiral in the American Navy. He went over to Russia and Catherine the Great asked him to put the Navy together. So the two greatest navies in the world founded by a pirate. Other pirates, Sir Francis Drake, Sir Walter Raleigh, Jean Lafitte. You know, the world has had some very significant and positive changes because of pirates. And we happen to have created a new brand or a new type of pirate, pirates of compassion, who are dedicated to shutting down the pirates of greed. Yeah. So you've seen some of the campaigns uh, that we've been doing on the film. Uh, the Galapagos is our line in the sand. Uh, I said uh, 12 years ago, if we can't save the Galapagos, we're not going to save anything. So we're now in a full partnership with the Galapagos Park Rangers and the Ecuadorian police. So if you go to the Galapagos, those police dogs will be wearing the Sea Shepherd logo on their little jackets. And the, and the, and the, and the police radios in the Galapagos carry our logo on the radios. Uh, so we're in full partnership with them. And it's actually never really been done that a non-government organization has uh, combined in a partnership with policing forces in, in another country like that. And we provided a patrol boat, we have surveillance barges, and we're making real progress there, especially combating corruption amongst politicians. They've tried to kick us out a few times, but the people of the Galapagos and Ecuador stood behind us, and that's one of the reasons that we're still there. It's the same in places like Australia. If it wasn't for the fact that we had the support of the people of Australia and New Zealand, we wouldn't be able to operate there. The governments there hate us, by the way, but it's more important to have the support of the people than it is to have the support of the government. So every time they try to harass us, we just set the people on the government. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it was in that movie, V for, v for Vendetta, where he said that uh, governments, uh, people shouldn't be afraid of their governments, governments should be afraid of their people. And um, so two years, two years ago, for example, Australia denied me a visa and said I couldn't come back to Australia. wouldn't give a reason for it. But uh, in one weekend, we gathered 25,000 signatures at Circular Key in Sydney, got the support of a number of uh, the head of the Green Party, some senators, and by Monday, I had the visa. So, uh, you know, it's the people speaking, really, that enabled us to do that. Because people want to save this planet. They want to save this planet for our, for our children, our children's children, and they are, I think people are really fed up with all of the talk, talk, talk that never accomplishes anything. We have all the rules, the regulations, and the treaties we need to protect our oceans. What we don't have is a government anywhere with the uh, will, the economic and political will to actually enforce those laws. So out there it's the Wild West. So we're sort of like the self-appointed police force. But uh, we're hoping that this will encourage people from all over the world, because I don't believe that we're going to solve anything through big organizations. Change comes through hundreds of thousands of small organizations tackling hundreds of thousands of issues. And strength lies through diversity, just like it does in any 
ecosystem. So with Sea Shepherd, we have our, sh our, our crew on our ships, which of course people see a lot because of the TV show, but just as important are the shore volunteers, the shore crew that make it possible for us to have that Navy out on the oceans. And also our supporters from around the world. So those three groups, the supporters who support us financially, the shore crew who work to make sure that every, we get everything we need for our ships, who raise money and materials for those ships, and of course, the crew on board the ships. Those are the three elements that make it possible. And on all three levels, that will, the underlying um, force, which is behind all of everybody's involvement, is simply passion and wanting to see real results. And I think that uh, over the years we've been able to secure those results. People want to see lives saved. They want to see these outlaws shut down. And I think we've been able to do that over the years. Our clients, aside from all of that, are not people though. Our clients are whales and sharks and uh, fish and, uh, and, and tuna and everything. Those are our clients. And uh, so we're a little bit immune from uh, criticism. So when people say, well, we disagree with what you're doing out there, well, find a whale or a shark that disagrees with it, we might listen to you. <laughs> so we'll be returning to the uh, Southern Ocean this year. Also, uh, this summer, we'll be doing a project in the South Pacific to oppose uh, shark finning. This is becoming a major problem. The shark has shaped evolution uh, in our oceans for 450 million years, and uh, we're on the verge of losing many species of sharks. They're taking 90 million sharks out of the oceans every year. A lot of this mainly just for the shark fins, for shark fin soup, which has absolutely no nutritional value at all. And um, why? Because there's a more and more of a demand for it, because diminishment is, uh, is actually stimulating demand, not just for the sharks, but all fish. But what we're trying to get, a, we want to actually tackle discovery in National Geographic and their ridiculously overly dramatic portrayals of sharks as monsters. I mean, really, how many people are killed by sharks every year? The average is five. How many do we kill of them? 90 million. Who's a monster? But how many people are killed every year by ostriches? A hundred. <laughs> ostriches are 20 times more dangerous than sharks, but nobody wants to kill off all the ostriches. Number of people killed by Coke machines falling on them every year is nine. So your average Coke machine is more dangerous than the shark. And for anybody who plays golf, playing golf is much more dangerous than swimming with sharks because more people are struck by lightning on golf courses every year than are attacked by sharks. So really what we have to understand is that we go into the, the realm of the shark, we understand how the shark behaves, and I think for the most part, unfortunately, most people who are attacked by sharks is because of ignorance of the shark's behavior. Uh, for instance, on the west coast of uh, Australia, where there's been a lot of shark attacks recently, and people say, we don't understand why. Well, we've told them why, but they don't want to listen. Every week, ships leave Fremantle port heading for the Middle East with a cargoes of, of tens of thousands of sheep. And when they die, they throw them overboard. And while they're, and while they're uh, underway, all of the urine and the feces from those 10,000 sheep go into the ocean, and that contains blood. So they're literally pulling the sharks into the shore with those ships, and then they wonder why there's attacks. So there are there are ways of getting around this, but they don't really want to listen to it. It's the same with seals. The seal hunt in Canada, it's over economically. The government will hang on to it for a couple of years. They set a quota of 400,000 this year. They won't take more than 25,000 25, total. The reason being is we've succeeded in accomplishing what we set out to do 35 years ago, destroy the market for the seal pelts. They're now banned in the Euro Europe, they're banned in the US, they're banned in Russia, and China's not interested in them. It survives through subsidies, but that can only go on for so long. And one of the problems that we have is that, you know, as uh, we diminish fish in our oceans, we have to look around for scapegoats, somebody to blame other than ourselves. And so therefore they blame the sharks. Oh, if we just, or the sharks or the seals and everything. In other words, they say if we get rid of the seals, the fish will magically come back. But they don't understand that if you want more fish, you need more seals, not less because the way the ecosystem works is on, say, the eastern seaboard, for example, 
the governments look at it this way, people, fish, and seals. They just see three things, but there's 970 species interdependent with each other in that ecosystem, and you have to take that into account. That the biggest predator of cod, for instance, isn't other than people, isn't the seal, it's capelin, mackerel, uh, and other fishes, which the seal eats. So when you lower seal populations, you increase predatory fish populations, causing an even further decline in the cod. These so-called scientists, who I call biostitutes, have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> they're paid to say what they say, and, 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 and that, is, that is a problem. But let's just look at the statistics. The domestic house cat eats more fish than all the world seals put together. Stop feeding fish to cats, and that would solve that problem. Pigs are eating more seals and all. Uh, pigs are eating more fish than all of the sh sharks in the world. So the pig is now one of the number one aquatic predators on the planet. <laughs> and chickens on factory farms in Denmark alone are eating more fish than all the world's puffins put together. Forty percent of all the fish taken from the ocean is fed to livestock, and so we are literally eating our oceans alive. And these fish cannot compete with what we're doing. We should take a lesson from the Polynesians. They used to have a thing called taboo, where they would set aside, say, a bay, like in Hawaii, Hanama Bay would be considered taboo for 20 years. If you were caught fishing there, if you were Polynesian before the Europeans were there, it was a death penalty. They were very rigid on their regulations. So that protected the fish. We have no taboo areas anywhere in the world today, so we need taboo areas. So we're trying to get the Mediterranean declared taboo and all these other areas. Fish have no place to go. They have no place to run to and we are really wiping them out. And the best way, I think, to explain this is, uh, I, when I'm talking to, to uh, kids at schools and everything, is to just compare this to the Earth, to a spaceship. In fact, that's what we are, we're a spaceship. We're on a spaceship traveling around this incredible Milky Way galaxy at 500 miles uh, a second, so we're traveling pretty fast. But like any spaceship, it has a life support system. And that life support system is the biosphere. It provides us with the food we eat, the oxygen we breathe, regulates our temperature and climate. And that life support system is run by a crew, a crew of Earthlings, not us. We're the passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're having a great time entertaining ourselves. The crew are doing all the work. And the crew include the bacteria, the insects, the worms, the trees, the plants, the fish, all of those creatures that run everything. And what are we doing? We're killing off the crew. And there's only so many crew members we can kill off before the biosphere begins to collapse. And we don't know it, where that point is. So really what we're doing is we have to protect the crew of Spaceship Earth if, we're all, if, if we, the passengers, are going to survive. About four years ago, I made a statement that worms are more important than people. And a lot of people got very upset about that. Uh, it was on the Fox Network. And you know they said, how could you say such a completely outrageous thing like that, that worms are more important than people. And my answer to that was I said it because worms are more important than people. And <laughs> the reasoning behind that is that worms can live on the earth without people, but people cannot live on the earth without worms. We need them, they don't need us. We need bees and trees and insects, they don't need us. They are important and we have to protect them. So I think if we have a the ultimate responsibility as a human being on this planet is to protect those species that ensure our survival. I think it's only fair. And so this is what Sea Shepherd is all about, protecting those other species and doing so in, in a completely different manner. So thank you all very much for, for coming and supporting us. And uh, thanks to your effort, we're, we're well on our way to uh, being able to acquire that fourth ship. We should have it here before the, uh, the next Antarctic cam campaign comes along. Oh, and one other thing I forgot is that we've just gotten a lot stronger too because uh, right now the Steve Irwin and the Bridget Bardot are in, um, in Williamstown, Victoria, Australia. And we now have been given our own dock and warehouse there. So that means we have a permanent spot. And I just want to say one other thing about the Bridge of Bardot. You know, originally, you might get confusing sometimes because in the campaign before last, it was the Gojira, which is Japanese for Godzilla. I just couldn't resist the headlines in the Japanese paper of Godzilla attacks whaling fleet. And uh, we actually have on tape a Japanese whaler on the radio saying, oh, we're being attacked by Godzilla. So that was worth it naming there, but unfortunately, 
Unfortunately, the only thing more scary than Godzilla is Godzilla's lawyers, so they insisted we had to take the name off the boat. So we simply turned the beast into the beauty and had it named after Bridget Bardot, who's a longtime supporter of ours. So it's the same ship, and it was damaged this, uh, this last campaign, but it's been fully repaired, and it's now 150% stronger than it was before it was damaged. So uh, th that ship was the one that... That's the vessel we'll be taking to the South Pacific to protect sharks this, uh, this year. So the uh, Sea Shepherd Navy, which I call Neptune's Navy, is, is, is getting stronger, and it's getting stronger because of the support of people like yourself. So thank you very much.